So I'm really excited today to introduce Dr. David Williams, who will be um, this morning's lecturer, and then this afternoon he'll be presenting our commencement address and will be also receiving an honorary degree from the University of Toledo, and he is quite deserving of that recognition. Um, currently, he serves as the Florence and Laura Norman Professor of Public Health and Chair of the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He's also a professor of African and African American Studies and Sociology at Harvard University, and previously served on the faculty of Yale and the University of Michigan, and holds a Master's in Public Health from Loma Linda and a doctoral degree in sociology from Michigan. He's an internationally recognized authority on the social influence of health, and he's been invited to keynote conferences, I think we decided last night, every place but Antarctica. Um, he is the author of more than 500 scientific papers, and his research has enhanced our understanding of the ways in which race, racism, socioeconomic stratus, stress, health behaviors, and religious involvement affect physical and mental health. His tool that he developed, the Everyday Discrimination Scale, um, is the most widely used measure of discrimination in health studies. And I did opine last night an event that as scientists, right, we're very proud when we publish a great paper, right? That's really spectacular. And then the next level is when people cite your work, right? Um, and, you know, we think about things like the H index, and that's really exciting to see others referencing your great works. And I think the next step in that evolution is when people begin using the methodologies that you have developed to do their own research. And as an example, we shared uh, a publication just from last month, the MESA, MESA study, um, uh, a long-term NIH-funded study, which showed that using the tool that Dr. Williams developed, um, they could tie uh, both cardiovascular mortality and all-cause mortality to experiences of discrimination in the study participants. And so again, Dr. Williams has really done phenomenal work that is original, that's cited by others, and has become a tool for others to use to do their own research. He's received for this numerous awards and honors. He was elected to the National Academy of Medicine and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences. Um, he's had distinguished contribution awards from the American Sociological Association, the American Psychological Association, the New York Academy of Medicine, the Association of University Programs in Health Administration, and the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences at the NIH. He is ranked as one of the top 10 most cited social scientists in the world and the most cited black scholar in the social sciences worldwide. Um, in 2014, Thomas Reuters ranked him as one of the world's most influential scientific minds. He has been involved in the development of health policy at the national level in the United States and has served on federal advisory committees and testified at congressional briefings. He served on 10 committees for the National Academy of Medicine, including the committee that prepared the Unequal Treatment Report. He also played a visible leadership role in raising awareness of the problem of health inequities and interventions to address them. He's served as a staff director at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Commission to build a healthier America and as a keynote scientific advisor on the award-winning PBS film series, Unnatural Causes is Inequality Making Us Sick. He and his research have been featured by some of the nation's top uh, lay print and television news organizations, and his TED Talk has been translated into only 22 languages and has 1.8 million views. If that's not enough, with funding from the NIH and the sponsorship of the WHO, he directed the South African Stress and Health Study, the first nationally representative study of the prevalence and correlates of mental disorders in Sub-Saharan Africa, and has worked on ethnic inequities with the Toledo, or um, Toledo, close, Toronto Public Health Department. You know, I, I mean, it's graduation day. I'm just thinking about Toledo, I'm sorry. Um, also, the National Health Service in the UK and the Pan American Health Organization. He serves on the Board of Trustees of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the W.K. Kellogg Foundation Solidarity Council on Racial 
Equity and on the board of the UK's National Health Service Race and Health Observatory. You know, one final comment is um, how refreshing it is to have a scientist of this caliber amongst us today. We had a spirited conversation last night about the um, pursuit of truth, and it really is a great honor to have somebody amongst us who is uncovering truths that sometimes make us uncomfortable, but will ultimately make us a better country and a better world. Thank you. I thank Dr. Cooper so very much for his kind words of introduction and for all of you being at this early morning talk. It's an early morning talk for me. Um, most of my talks are given in the middle of the day, you know, when everyone is fully awake. But thank you so much. Um, I'm going to jump right into my talk. Um, I have a lot of territory to cover, and I want to leave time for us to have a good um, conversation. So my topic is understanding and effectively addressing racial inequities in health. Um, so let me see, my first attempt at this isn't working. The arrow key is not working if my technician is nearby. Neither is the key on this working. Um, so maybe I suppose to turn it on. Ah, okay, I'll, I've turned it on. We, we, we are in business. Um, there are racial ethnic differences in health in the United States, uh, which we have some sense of. 50% of Americans don't know that that's true, um, but at least 50% know that. But what most people don't know, the pattern is evident around the world. It's evident in virtually every country in Latin America for which we have data, um, that the African descended population or the indigenous population have worse health than the rest of the population. It's true in Australia, New Zealand, uh, it's true in Europe where we have data, uh, it's true in South Africa. So it's, it's, it's true, um, it's a global problem. But here is US data and just gives us one example, infant mortality, the death of a baby before its first birthday. Um, and it's generally reported at, at the number of deaths per thousand live births. And you could see the black, the native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander population, the American Indian and Alaska native population, particularly those three, have markedly elevated risk of death uh, compared to the white population. Uh, you see Latinos. And some of the work we've done looking at the Hispanic population in the United States, we see striking differences between US born Latinos and foreign born Latinos that US-born Latinos have a profile similar to African-Americans and foreign-born Latinos have a profile similar to that of whites. Um, if we have time, we can discuss why that might be the case. COVID-19 has made all of these disparities worse. Um, here is uh, national data. Uh, early in the pandemic, the first 500,000 deaths, there have been a lot twice that number of deaths. Um, looking at age-adjusted uh, mortality ratios, and you could see that the Pacific Islander, black, Latino, and indigenous population, all of those with the high rates of infant mortality also tend to have higher rates of death from COVID-19 between twice as high to 2.6 times higher. Um, people sometimes confuse the rate, the death rates to the number of deaths. There's a study published in Social Science and Medicine that found that white Americans, when they discovered that the COVID-19 death rates were higher for the disadvantaged racial groups, many white Americans stopped taking precautions against COVID, not realizing that the majority of people who have died, more than half of the 520,000, almost 300,000 were whites. Um, so I, I, I like to show the numbers so that people are aware that the, 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 the rate and the, the numbers are, in fact, are very different things. This is the decline in life expectancy from 2019 to 2020, um, primarily reflecting the impact of COVID. Um, and you could see the decline was largest for African-American and Hispanic males, 3.3 uh, and 3.7 years decline, more than two year decline for black and Hispanic females, and more than a one year decline uh, for white males and females. We have not seen declines like this in the United States in life expectancy from one year to the next, except back in the Second World War. There was a year back in 1943 where we saw declines of that magnitude. So this is a massive uh, change. The racial inequities in health are also quite persistent over time. 
Um, so here is life expectancy at birth. On average, how long will the average person live? Um, 1950 data, but that was only reported uh, for blacks and whites. Um, and you could see there was an eight year gap in life expectancy in 1950. Um, and the good news, by 2010, you could see that gap, that gap was reduced to a four-year gap. So the gap was cut by half. At the same time, while the good news is, both blacks and whites, you could see over time, increase in life expectancy through 2010. Um, but there's still a huge gap for two groups living in the same society. So, Let's ask the question, the life expectancy at whites in 1950, 69.1 years on average. How long did it take for African Americans to catch up to the health that whites had in 1950? 1990, 40 years later, African Americans' life expectancy was 69.1 years. So these are striking differences for two groups living in the same uh, society. And what you can see for both African Americans and whites from 2010 to 2020 is the decline in, in life expectancy, and that reflected the, the impact of COVID that I just showed you before, but you can also see the differential decline. So you see a widening of the gap, a four-year gap in life expectancy in 2010, a six-year gap in 2020, reflecting the impact of COVID. What drives these large racial inequities? Um, my doctoral degree was in sociology. And one of the lessons I learned in sociology is that virtually every desirable resource is distributed by socioeconomic status, whether measured by income, education, occupational status, and health. It's true in America. It's true in every country in the world where we have data. Persons of higher income, education, occupational status, and wealth have better access to society's resources. And health is, in fact, one of those factors. They're large inequities in health by socioeconomic status. This is just one example of a study we did, national data for the United States, um, looking at the relative risk of all-cause mortality by income. And you could see that persons whose income was less than $25,000 a year, that's about where the poverty level is for a family of four, have an overall mortality rate about three times higher than those who have incomes of $115,000 or more. But you can see it's a graded effect. Every higher level of income is, in fact, associated with a lower risk of all-cause mortality. Just one of literally thousands and thousands of studies that document this pattern. And that gives us some insight, because race ethnicity in the United States is strongly related to socioeconomic status. Here's one example of that, um, median household income in the United States. And I've just translated, instead of putting the actual numbers, the data into a way you can't miss the point. So I'm standardizing on the household income of, of whites as $1. And for every dollar of household income that whites receive, Asian households receive a dollar and 23 cents. The Asian category in the United States is heavily made up of immigrants. Almost 70% of Asians in the United States are immigrants. They've come to the United States with um, high levels of education. Asians have twice the level of college completion, for example, than the white population. Um, but the other striking factor affecting the Asian data is this is household income. Asians, compared to all the other racial groups, are more likely to be living in multi-generational households. So therefore, to have multiple persons contributing to household income. So if we had used a per capita or per person measure of income, whites have the highest level of per capita income. But let's look at the historically disadvantaged groups. 2018, for every dollar of household income white households receive, Latino households receive 73 cents, and Native American and African American households receive 59 cents. What is stunning about the 59 cents figure for blacks in 2018, that's identical to the black-white gap in income in 1978. Why did I pick 1978? 1978 was the peak year of the narrowing of the black-white gap in income as a result of the civil rights policies and the war on poverty of the 60s and 70s. And so it was reduced to, 70, to 59 cents. It had been lower than 50 cents at one point at the beginning of the 60s. So this was progress. But in 2018, it is still 59 cents. Most of my students and most Americans think we have made much more progress than that. 
And has it been stuck at 59 cents over time? No. It got worse throughout the decade of the 1980s. Reaganomics was not good to the black community. And it was not until the mid-1990s, during the Clinton era, it got back up to 59 cents. And it's a penny up and down from that since then. The important take-home point, we have made much less progress on reducing racial gaps on health and economic status than most Americans think. And the large racial gaps in income markedly understate the racial gap in economic status. What do I mean when I say that? Well, income captures the flow of resources into the household, salary and wages typically, but it tells us nothing about the economic reserves that households have to cushion shortfalls of income. We get that from data on wealth that captures your savings, your investments, um, the other economic resources. And here is data from the Federal Reserve Board. For every dollar of wealth that white households have, black households have 10 pennies and Latino households have 12 pennies. So when you are low in income, and low in wealth, although we may all may have been in the same storm of the pandemic, we're not in the same boats. And some boats uh, that are better economically resourced are better able uh, to weather uh, the storms. When my career started, most researchers thought that racial ethnic gaps in health were simply a function of the racial ethnic gaps in socioeconomic status. So if you looked at blacks and whites, for example, at the same levels of income and education, race would no longer matter. We now know that life is more complicated than that, and I want to share with you results of analyses that a group of us did uh, years ago um, using national data for the United States, looking at life expectancy at age 25. And what it's going to illustrate is the power of socioeconomic status, but also something else about race. So at age 25, the average white American will live five years longer than the average black American. So there's a five-year gap. But if you look within whites, by education level, whites with a college degree or more education live 6.4 years longer than whites who have not finished high school. A bigger gap within whites. Similarly, within African Americans, a 5.3 year gap between those with the highest education and those with the lowest education. So should we abandon looking at race and just look at socioeconomic status? That argument has been made in the medical journal two years ago. Um, and I would say not so fast. Why? Because race still matters at each level of socioeconomic status. So white high school dropouts um, live 3.1 years longer than black high school dropouts. And stunningly, the gap widens as education increases. And this is national data for the United States. Look at the data. The most highly advantaged blacks, those with a college degree or more education, have lower life expectancy than whites with a college degree, lower life expectancy than whites with some college education, lower life expectancy than whites who graduated from high school. So what do these data tell us? And remember, this is national data for the US. They tell us that there's something about income and education that matters for your health regardless of your race. But they also tell us there's something else about race that matters even after we've taken income and education into account. And so scholars have been asking for the intensively for the last 25, 30 years, what else is it about race? And could racism be a critical mi missing piece of the puzzle to understand the patterning of racial differences in health? So I want to talk to you about the house that racism built. Um, and I'm arguing that racism is a societal system, just as we have other social, political, religious, cultural uh, systems, legal systems. Racism is a system like that. Um, it's a system that categorizes and ranks, devalues and disempowers and differentially allocates opportunities and resources. Central to this system is the ideology of inferiority. Some groups are inferior, some inferior, and this system leads to the development of negative attitudes and beliefs, prejudice and stereotypes, for example, towards outgroups, and differential treatment, discrimination, by both individuals and social institutions. I want to show you how racism affects health and show you empirical evidence documenting some of these patterns. So racism as a societal system, the most profound way in which it affects health is through what 
historically was called institutional racism. In the last three or four years, um, people are using the term structural racism, but if you go back to writings of the 60s and 70s, the term used would be institutional uh, racism. Uh, to, to, uh, as the ways in which policies are embedded in, in society and social institutions that have consequences. One that I have studied is residential segregation. Here's a 2001 paper that I wrote where I argued with uh, Dr. Chiquita Collins that segregation is a fundamental cause of racial disparities in health. That we're kidding ourselves that we will address them if we don't address segregation. And segregation refers to policies that developed in the United States um, that determine where someone could live based on your race. Those policies are officially illegal since the 1960s, but the processes put in place are still largely intact um, in the United States. And someone says, but what does segregation have to do with anything? John Sell, a historian at Duke University, passed away recently, uh, wrote a book um, a long time ago, 1982, about the origins of segregation in the US South and South Africa. He actually showed that the framers of apartheid in South Africa got their ideas of apartheid in the early 20th century by looking at how well segregation was working in the United States. So that's one of our exports. Historians point to Hitler, said he got his ideas of race science from looking at the American eugenics movement. So we have exported some things that we should not be particularly proud of. Importantly, John Sell argues that residential segregation in the United States was one of the most successful domestic policies of the 20th century. And someone says, what does segregation have to do with health? Well, think of segregation as a burglar at midnight. When it shows up in the community, valuables disappear. Things like quality schools and safe playgrounds and access to good jobs and a healthy environment, safe housing, access to high quality transportation, and even access to medical care. Research in the United States reveal that all of these desirable resources vary by neighborhood, vary by community, vary by zip code, vary by where you live. And it's not accidental, it reflects policies that were implemented. You want some empirical evidence? Uh, this is a study done by William Julius Wilson and Robert Sampson, two of my colleagues at Harvard, two of America's most eminent sociologists. They studied the 171 largest cities in the United States and said it's not even one city where whites live under equal conditions to those of blacks, and that the worst urban context in which whites reside is considerably better than the average context of black communities. Now that's a 1995 study, so someone says, well, have things gotten better? I'm gonna share with you the work of Professor Dolores Acevedo Garcia, uh, was a colleague of mine at Harvard, she's now with Brandeis. She has created an amazing resource. She calls it the Neighborhood Opportunity Index. She ranks every county in the United States, every city, and most census tracts on 29 different <coughs> indicators of access to opportunity for kids. I'm giving you examples of these indicators. The quality of schools and early childhood centers, the high school graduation rate, uh, income level, home ownership rate, quality of the air, water, soil, um, access for health like green space, healthy food outlets, walkability. Those are a few examples of the 29 different indicators. And then she asked the question, and by the way, this is a 2020 paper in the journal Health Affairs. Then she asked the question, let's look at the 100 largest metropolitan areas in the United States. Who lives? Which children live in the very low and low opportunity neighborhoods? 67%, two thirds of all black children in the 100 largest metro areas are in very low and low quality neighborhoods. That's also true of 58% of Latinos, 53% of Native Americans, and um, almost one in five uh, whites and Asian children. If you ask, look at the opposite end of the spectrum, who lives in the high and very high opportunity neighborhoods, almost two thirds of all white and Asian kids compared to about one in five African American and Latino kids. So your race determines dramatically 
access to opportunity. And that has enormous consequences. What research finds, and I'm going to show you two studies from Harvard economists, that segregation is the reason why racial ethnic differences in income and education exist in the first place. This is David Cutler. Uh, when I went to Harvard, he was the dean of the social sciences, one of the country's eminent economists. Using fancy econometric models I cannot even fully describe, using national data for the United States, he shows statistically if you could eliminate residential segregation, you would completely erase black-white differences in income, in education, and in unemployment, and reduce black-white differences in single motherhood by two-thirds. All of these striking differences are linked to opportunity at the neighborhood level. One more study, one more Harvard economist, Raj Chetty. He has gotten access to all census data uh, for more than a decade. And what he has asked is an intergenerational question. He says, let's look at black and white children who begin life at the same level of household income. How are the children doing in the next generation? So controlling for household income. And what he finds? In 99% of census tracts in America, census tracts are small area groupings, 99%. Black boys who began life at the same level of household income as white boys earn less income. Why? Because they're lazy? Why? Because they're not working hard enough? No. They live in neighborhoods that differ in access to opportunity. And again, it's not accidental. It's policies that were implemented that have produced the variation in access to opportunity across contexts. Black boys do as well as white boys in neighborhoods with good resources, but there are very few such neighborhoods in the United States. What these data tell us is that the racial inequities in income and education, occupational status that matter for life and health do not reflect a broken system. Instead, they reflect a carefully crafted system functioning as plans, successfully implementing social policies, many of which were rooted in racism. They are not accidents. Um, they are not acts of God, they're not random events. Racism has produced a truly rigged system in the United States, and it's not what individuals are doing, it's the policies that have been set in place, and that's why these are called examples of structural racism. They're policies set in place that are operating on autopilot, but producing inequities on a large scale. And what research, mine and that of others, finds is that when you're low in economic status, and you live in disadvantaged, segregated neighborhoods, you have higher levels of exposure and greater clustering of economic stress, of psychosocial stresses, of physical and chemical stresses. And all of these add up to have consequences for your health. So I've talked about structural, upstream, institutional racism and its consequences for health. Let's talk about individual discrimination. Um, could be an added source of toxic stress. Martin Luther King said in 1967 that discrimination is a hell hung that knows that Negroes in every waking moment of their lives, declaring that the lies of their inferiority is accepted as a truth in a society dominating them. He was not a scientist, so this is simply an idea, but it could be tested. So I decided to test it by developing measures of discrimination. So first see, let's look at what the levels of discrimination are and then understand its consequences for health. I want to, from a review paper I did with two of my students some time ago, uh, reviewing the research on discrimination in health, this slide illustrates just some of the findings from published peer-reviewed papers. Each, each, each statement, each word or uh, phrase reflects uh, a different health outcome. Uh, from a published peer-reviewed paper. So high levels of, and this is not, this is just the everyday discrimination scale, there are lots of other measures of discrimination. High levels of everyday discrimination is linked to incident, that's new cases of metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular uh, disease, breast cancer, type 2 diabetes. It's linked to engaging in multiple of, of negative behaviors that have adverse health consequences, linked to coronary artery calcification and tumor media thickness, heart rate variation, visceral fat, AFib linked to adult onset um, of, of um, asthma, uh, linked to uh, blood pressure, 
linked to poor sleep quality and quantity, linked to high levels of inflammation, high levels of cortisol, shorter telomere length, allostatic load, a summary measure of biological dysregulation, linked to high levels of obesity, linked to less engagement with the healthcare system, less follow through with, with recommendations from providers, and linked to high levels of both DSM disorders, that's defined psychiatric disorders, as well as high levels of psychological distress. So this just illustrates the research documenting how broad-based are the adverse effects of just those little indignities, being treated with less courtesy and respect, being by others, uh, receiving poorer service from others in restaurants or stores. This is Chester Pierce, um, an African-American psychiatrist, was at Harvard University, um, and back in 1970, without the scientific evidence I just showed you, he said, what the reader must bear in mind is that these assaults, he called them, to black dignity and black hope are incessant and cumulative. He went on to say any single one may not be gross. The items on the everyday discrimination scale are not gross. But in fact, the major vehicle of racism in this country, he said, is offenses done to blacks by whites in this sort of gratuitous, never-ending way. These offenses are, and he coined this term that is very widely used, microaggressions. Um, and it's just, I recognize the, the, the shoulders that we stand on in doing this work. That's exactly what he predicted without the empirical evidence that I showed you. There's also research documenting their hidden ways in which stressors linked to race and racism adversely affect health. I need to move on here quickly. Um, first, this is a study that found that over 70% of black women in America were very concerned that their children might be harmed by the police. A 2009 study. This is not a new problem. Here is a study of 3,000 mothers in 20 cities published in 2021. And almost one in five urban youth who have been stopped by the police by the age of 15. And mothers of youth who were stopped by the police were more than twice as likely to report both depression and anxiety-related sleep difficulties. So there are spillover effects from this larger environment. This is a study I did with one of my former students and others. We got a database that listed every police shooting in the United States. We looked, collected the data, collected the data over three years, and we linked it to another database from the CDC that had the mental health of the population in every state. And we were able to document using a quasi-experimental design that every police shooting of an unarmed black person led to worse mental health not just for the family and friends, but for the entire black population in the state in which it occurred, and those mental health symptoms were elevated for three months. There was no effect on whites, and it was a specific effect. If, the black, if there was a police shooting of a black person that was armed, there was no effect. It was only police shootings of an unarmed black person. And we think that the, we can't, don't know for sure, but we think what that reflects is the perception that a shooting of an unarmed person means you don't have to be doing anything wrong for, for it to happen to you that it was unjust and unfair, but also a sense of vulnerability. It could happen to you. It could happen to your father, your brother, a anyone in your family. And what's the consequences of all of this cumulative exposure to discrimination as well as all of the economic, chemical, psychosocial stresses I've talked about? Researchers are using terms in the literature as there's accelerated aging taking place among minorities, or premature aging, or biological weathering. Um, and all of them are capturing the, the greater physiological dysregulation and the earlier onset of disease. Giving you one example of the earlier onset of disease, this is um, data from the CDC um, showing um, the onset of high blood pressure by age. And you can see at every age, let's just look 50 to 64, by 50 to 64, 61% of African Americans have hypertension compared to 41% of whites. So I've talked about um, structural racism, segregation. I've talked about individual discrimination. Let's talk about discrimination built into the culture um, uh, of our, uh, the, the negative stereotypes, assumptions that are made about different racial groups. Research finds it trigger racial discrimination that can reduce access to societal resources. There is evidence um, of implicit bias in medical care. The unequal treatment report was mentioned. Um, it was a report 
um, requested by the United States Congress. Um, Kevin Schulman was a researcher that went to a, a medical conference, uh, had over 800 internists uh, look at a video of a patient and says, given the sim symptoms described, what would you do? What the clinicians didn't know is all the patients were actors. All of them were trained to say they had the same job, lived in the same neighborhood, had a, you know, and were trained to describe the symptoms in identical words, even having the same facial expressions that, uh, across uh, the group. The only thing that differed was some were black and some were white and some were male and some were female. And what the study found with the presentation of the same symptoms, doctors prescribed the prescriptions were different. With, um, men, with women and blacks receiving uh, a poorer care given the presentation of symptoms. And it got a lot of press. Um, this was back in like 1997, 1998. And uh, Congress voted to ask the National Institute of Medicine in those days to answer the question, did what happened at a medical conference with fake patients actually happen when individuals enter healthcare context in the United States. I was one of about 14 uh, faculty from across the country who served on the committee um, that prepared the unequal treatment report, released in 2002, published in 2003. There's a lot of activity now in DC about the unequal treatment at 20. This 20 years later, where are we? But I can't talk about that. Um, uh, what the study found was that populations of color receive poorer um, uh, medical care across multiple contexts. I don't have, but let me give you one example, just so that you understand the, the, the reality of it, and I'll give you a more recent a, example. Um, one example uh, of the studies, uh, Dr. Kevin Schulman was an emergency room physician at UCLA. He asked a simple question. When a patient comes into the UCLA emergency department with a long bone fracture, that's a broken bone in the arm or legs, does the patient's ethnicity determine whether or not the patient gets pain medication or not? And he looked at data of everyone treated in the UCLA emergency department for one year, and 56% of Hispanic patients with a long bone fracture did not get pain medication compared to 24% of whites who didn't get pain medication. It's a big difference. And he statistically adjusted for every factor what how, how severe was the fracture, what time they showed up in the ER, whether they got injured on the job or not, how long they spent in the ER. And he found that statistically controlling for everything else, the single biggest predictor of whether the patient got pain medication or not, was it the patient was Latino, and that there was a seven and a half times, the odds ratio was seven and a half times, with adjusted for other factors of a Latino patient not getting pain medication. He moved from UCLA to Emory University in Atlanta, repeated the same study. Three hospital emergency rooms in Atlanta looking at black and white patients found exactly the same problem. A black patient with a broken bone in the arm or legs goes to the emergency department, less likely to get pain medication. i just give you one example. If you look at the unequal treatment report, it's a 500-page document. If you look at it report, this was found in every area of medicine with over 80 studies in the treatment of cardiovascular disease. There were more studies in that domain than any. So it was a real phenomenon. Um, populations of color receive poorer quality medical care. The problem continues. Just to give you one example of a 2020 paper from PNAS, a study of 1.8 million hospital births in Florida from 1992 to 2015, when cared for by white doctors, black babies are three times more likely than white newborns to die in the hospital. Disparity cut in half when black babies are cared for by a black doctor doesn't tell us what causes it, but it's an example of the striking persistence. So with all of these problems, the question is, what can we do? Strategy number one, we need to build more health into the delivery of medical care. Um, one important point is to ensure access to care for all. We are the only industrialized nation in the world that doesn't guarantee health care for all. Second, uh, I could elaborate on that, but in the interest of time, I move on. Um, diversify the workforce to meet the needs of all patients. I want to share with you a randomized controlled trial, high quality scientific study. Done in Oakland, California, took 1,300 black men who were recruited, gave them a voucher to go to a Saturday clinic um, for screening. Um, when they got to the clinic, they were randomized to see a black doctor, a patient, 
uh, a doctor of another race. What a study found was that men who saw a black doctor when there was racial concordance were more likely to talk about other health problems, more likely to do the screening for diabetes, more likely to get a flu vaccine, more likely to do the screening for cholesterol. So much more engagement with healthcare when there was racial concordance. I have good news. Uh, with first, bad news first. The bad news first is that in 2014, there were 27 fewer African-American males in the first year of medical school than they had been in 78. In the 1960s, 2.9 percent of practicing physicians were black. In 2015, 5 percent are black, 6 percent Latino, uh, 3 tenths of 1 percent indigenous. We have a long ways to go. Here's the good news. Another study from Northern California of persons with HIV, AIDS, and their treatment. There were racial disparities in the uh, black patients receiving the appropriate treatment, those who got the treatment, disparities in taking the treatment as prescribed, and disparities also in viral suppression, the treatment working to produce the desired results. However, the researchers had administered a cultural competence scale. And what they found, that when cultural competence was high, in the provider, regardless of the race of the provider, there were no racial disparities. What did it mean to be high in cultural competence? The 20-item scale, I'm going to show you six items. <clears throat> Providers who agree that family and friends are important to health as doctors. Providers who said that social history contributed to how they care for their patients. Providers who said they were familiar with their beliefs their patients had, even they had to ask them about that. <laughs> Providers who said, I asked my patients what alternative therapies they use. Providers who said, I find out what my patients think is the cause of their illness. Providers who said, I involve patients in decisions about their health care. What emerges, this doesn't tell us how to get there, but it describes a picture of a provider who respects his patients, who engages with them in communication, um, and under those conditions, regardless of the race ethnicity of the provider, there were, in fact, no disparities. What else do we need to do? We need to build more health in the delivery of care by providing care that addresses the social context. The World Health Organization asks, what do we accomplish if all we do is treat illness and send people back to live in the same conditions that made them sick in the first place? This is a report, I can't elaborate on this, but this is a wonderful report, came out in the last two years from the National Academy of Medicine, describing how we can integrate social care into the delivery of medical care. I'll give you one example, uh, high quality scientific evidence, uh, Dr. David Olds um, has taken pregnant women, teen pregnant moms, randomized them to receive good prenatal care, even given them vouchers for transportation to get to prenatal care, and the intervention group gets home visits from nurses. Nurses make home visits. Nurses talk to them about their health risks, but it also talks to them about maternal employment, about relationships with their partner, about their future. It's, it's, it's a much more global than just the healthcare issues. What the research finds, remember these, uh, he's done three randomized control trials, one in upstate New York, uh, primarily with white women, one in Memphis, Tennessee, primarily with African-American women, one in Denver, Colorado, primarily with Latino women. Three randomized control trials. What he finds, this program reduces child abuse and neglect, improves birth outcomes, reduces subsequent pregnancies, reduces welfare and food stamp use, and although it's expensive to send a nurse, there's a $17,000 return to society for each family served. So it's a dramatic example of taking the social context much more broadly um, can have a positive impact. Another example, classic, Len Syme from Berkeley, 1978 study, took low-income hypertensive patients, 80% black, randomized them again, routine care, go to your doctor, get your blood pressure medication, go home. A health education intervention, going to a, a program and listen to a health educator talk about them, blood pressure, or third, an outreach intervention. Take people from the community, lay people, train them in basics about blood pressure, but also trains them in opportunities that exist, resources that exist in the community to help people with problems they face. Those lay people make home visits. They talk about blood pressure, but they discuss the other stresses people face and link them to resources. What they find, seven months later, 
patients in the outreach group knew twice as much about blood pressure than patients in the other two groups, were more compliant in taking their blood pressure medication. Among good compliers in the outreach group, the medication actually works better. And third, they were more likely to have their blood pressure control. Everything we would want in our patients was evident in the group that their blood pressure was understood and addressed within the context of their lives. Strategy number two, identify supportive resource, protective factors and resilience resources people are suffering now, what might help them. I'll give you an example here quickly, a work done by, study done by Gene Brody. He's been studying um, African-American teens um, in rural Georgia. Those who were high on discrimination at age 16, 17, 18, by age 20, I didn't say age 40 or 30, by age 20, you could see higher levels of biomarkers, cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, blood pressure, inflammation, BMI at age 20. However, among those teens who were embedded in high quality social relationships with their parents, their teachers and their friends. The quality of social ties reduced the negative effect of exposure to discrimination on their health. So social ties is a powerful resource. Here's a national study that found among African Americans, higher levels of discrimination leads to higher levels of mental health symptoms. But religious involvement, frequency of church attendance, receiving support from persons at your place of worship, and seeking religious guidance in their, your everyday life, each of these aspects of religious in involvement reduced the negative effects of exposure to discrimination on mental health. And here is a study from Canada, <coughs> First Nation Youth in Canada. At the time of this study, this population had the highest levels of youth suicide in the world. However, researchers studying these First Nation communities found that half of them, the group as a whole has the highest levels of youth suicide in the world, half of the communities had no suicides at all. So they got to wondering what distinguishes those communities that have a lot of suicides versus those that don't have any. And they found five markers of challenging the government to titles for land, for the right of self-government, control over services, and having a building in the community where they taught young people their history and their culture. They found that each of those indicators of advocacy, protest, and empowerment was associated with lower risk of suicide and a strong dose-response relationship with the presence of more of those and the lower rate of, of suicide. We need to move further upstream. We need to create what I call communities of opportunity to minimize, neutralize, and dismantle the systems of racism that create inequities in health. When we think about health in the United States, we think about medical care, affordability, coverage, access, and personal responsibility. We also need to think of the larger living and working conditions and the larger social and economic opportunities and resources that affect health. We need to think then of how can we address the place-based determinants of health, enrich the quality of neighborhood environments, enhance economic development in poor areas, um, I, I hit the wrong button when I want to um, go back, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, um, and improve housing and neighborhood quality. Um, so these are examples uh, in, of what needs to be done in, in communities of opportunity. I'll mention a, a reference at the end, but I don't have time to discuss them. I'll talk about only two of them. Invest in early childhood and improve in neighborhood and housing conditions. In Chapel Hill, North Carolina, there was a Carolina Abyssadarian project they took poor kids, 80% of them black, at birth, randomized them to an early childhood center where they got a nurturing environment, good nutrition, high quality pediatric care. At age 21, higher academic performance, less drug use, better mental health, better, act, more active lifestyle. Mid 30s, markedly lower risk factors of cardiovascular disease and metabolic disease linked to what happened Birth through five, that was it. The intervention, birth through five. And you see these ripple effects across the life course, and it's a randomized controlled trial. 
improve neighborhood and housing conditions, uh, move into opportunities. An example of a public housing project where people were randomized to move to less poor housing, no intervention, New England Journal of Medicine paper, 10 to 15 years later, lower levels of obesity, severe obesity, diabetes risk, just changing the neighborhood environment. I, most people think that's so hard, we can't do it, it's difficult. I wanna give you one dramatic example, purpose-built communities, East Lake Meadows, Atlanta, um, a African American public housing project, high rates of crime, very dilapidated housing, 13% of adults employed, one of the worst performing schools in, in Georgia, the local elementary school. Um, they implemented a plan of, of tore down the public housing, built new housing, half the residents at market rate, half at public housing, 90% reduction in crime, high quality privately managed housing, every able-bodied person um, employed because they built resources available to, to ensure that people have access to job opportunity. And the school, 60% of the students qualify for reduced price lunch. The school is one of the best performing elementary school in the state of Georgia. It shows that it can be done. Purpose built communities, remember the name, they are providing free technical assistance to any community in the United States who want to implement the model. And I'm aware of more than 25 communities that have implemented the purpose built model. It can be done. I want to conclude by describing an innovative initiative from a healthcare institution, the Rush University Medical Center Equity Framework, New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst. You can find more details about it. In their service area in Chicago, there's as much as a 14 year gap in life expectancy between some census tracts that they serve and others. And they have implemented a plan to leverage their economic resources that ha they have as a health academic health center to improve economic conditions in the community to reduce the life expectancy gap by half within 10 years. They'll hire locally and develop local talent, including programs with the high school uh, and providing career ladders of development. They'll utilize local labor uh, for their projects, um, bring, have diversity hiring and contracts. They'll buy and source locally, even their supplies, looking at who do they buy them from. They uh, have invested in encouraging some of their low-income um, employees to, to invest in, in retirement uh, programs and providing retirement workshops for the community. And they're even providing financial incentives to their employees to volunteer with local community organizations, a massively comprehensive program. What's holding us back? Um, this is a statement that I wouldn't make, but this is what Martin Luther King said in 1967. It's striking. The majority of white Americans consider themselves sincerely committed to justice for the Negro. They believe that American society is essentially hospitable to fair play and to steady growth toward a middle class utopia embodying racial harmony. He continues, but unfortunately, this is a fantasy of self-deception and comfortable vanity. Overwhelmingly, America is still struggling with irresolution and contradictions. It has been sincere and even ardent in welcoming some change, but too quickly apathy and disinterest rise to the surface when the next logical steps are to be taken. We need to do three things. We need to raise awareness levels. We need to build political will. We need to build empathy. I had some slides upon empathy, but I'm gonna move forward from them and talk about what we need to do by leaving you with two um, quotations. Martin Luther King said, true compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It understands that edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. I've talked about an upstream edifice that is producing downstream consequences. And finally, the words of Robert Kennedy, speaking in South Africa in the 1960s, he said each time a man or woman stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he or she sends forth a tiny ripple of hope, and those ripples can build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. It's my hope that each one of us will be today encouraged to become and to continue to be a tiny ripple of hope that together we can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Thank you so very much for your time and attention.